Welcome back to our learning course. This lesson has two purposes. The first is to show you some more experiments on Pavlovian conditioning. In these experiments, we will see how conditioning is affected by several factors. That is, we will consider whether the animal is already familiar or not with the CS and US when the experiment starts, and how the CS and US follow one another in time. Future lessons will discuss other things that can influence conditioning. The second purpose is to start thinking what learning is trying to accomplish. At first sight, it will seem that the data that I will present have little in common. At the end of the lesson, we will see that they all make sense if we consider animals as naive detectives that are trying to learn about their environment. The meaning of this catchphrase will become clear as the lesson unfolds. With this in mind, let's look at some data. The first finding is that animals learn more easily about stimuli that are new. We can see this in an experiment on rabbit eye blink conditioning performed by Allen and colleagues. As indicated in the table, there were two groups of rabbits. The control group underwent the usual Pavlovian conditioning with the sound CS and an air puff aimed to the eye as a US. A second group, which we call the exposure group, underwent the same Pavlovian conditioning but before that, it received presentations of the sound not followed by the air path. In other words, for the control group, the sound was a new stimulus at the start of conditioning, while for the exposure group, it was not. As we can see in this graph, the exposure group learned more slowly than the control group. At any given point in the experiment, fewer rabbits in the exposure group blinked to the tone. Something similar happens if it's the US rather than the CS that is not new. The table shows the design of another experiment on rabbit eye blink conditioning performed by Saladin and colleagues. As you can see, the design is very similar to that of the previous experiment. The only difference is that the exposure group experiences the US rather than the CS. In this experiment, the US was a mild electric shock delivered to the side of the eye. The results are very similar to those of the previous experiment. Even in this case, we can see that rabbits in the exposure group learned to blink to the sound more slowly than rabbits in the control group. In summary, Pavlovian conditioning is more effective when both the CS and the US are new to the animal. We will see shortly how to interpret these results, but let's look at another set of findings first. The effectiveness of Pavlovian conditioning is strongly influenced by the temporal relationship between the CS and US, as we can see in this table. The most typical arrangement is called delay conditioning, which means that the CS is turned on and after some time the US happens, just as the CS is being turned off. The time between the CS turning on and the US is called the delay. This is the most used procedure as it is typically the most effective. I have indicated that the delay should be small in quotes because how long it can be depends on what CR we are conditioning. We will see examples in the next slide after we review the rest of the table. On the next row of the table, we have trace condition. This means that there is a gap between the CS and the US. The gap is called the trace interval. This procedure is effective if the gap is small. Again, in quotes, to indicate that things can be different for different CRs. Trace conditioning forces the animal to remember a CR that is no longer there. For this reason, it can be used to study short-term memory in animals. A later lesson covers short-term memory in more detail. The third and fourth row of the table show simultaneous and backward conditioning. These procedures are typically not very effective. That is, they produce a weak, CR or no CR at all. At the end of the lesson, we will ask what these findings mean. In the previous slide, we said that the time between the CS and US must be small if we want conditioning to be effective. Let's see what we mean by that. The time between the onset of the CS and the US is called the interstimulus interval, or ISI for short. In delay and trace conditioning, we can change the ISI and see how effective conditioning is. In this graph, we see results from an eye blink conditioning experiment with humans. The CS was a sound and the US an air pass. The horizontal axis shows the ISI, that is the delay between the beginning of the sound and the air pass. 
The vertical axis shows the percentage of trials in which people blinked after 20 training trials. As we can see, an ISI of about a quarter of the second worked best. For shorter or longer ISIs, Pavlovian conditioning was less effective, meaning that people learned to blink less. For ISIs longer than about two and a half seconds, there were practically no learning. The details of the ISI curve change a bit depending on how you do the experiment. For example, which CS and US you use. But in each experiment, you find an ISI that is more effective than others. If you change the behavior that is conditioned, however, the ISI curve can change a lot. In fact, sometimes an ISI of many hours can be effective. The best studied case of long ISI learning is taste aversion learning. In this kind of learning, animals learn that a particular flavor, here symbolized by pizza slice, leads to a bellyache. In experiments, we typically give animals a drug that causes a bellyache after they eat or drink something with a specific flavor. In nature, bellyaches happen when animals eat something poisonous or contaminated with bacteria. This graph is from an experiment with pigeons. Pigeons were allowed to drink slightly salty water, and then they were made sick after either a few minutes or three hours, six hours, nine hours, or 12 hours. After they recovered from the sickness, they were given a choice between drinking the salty water or plain water. The graph shows how much salty water they drank compared to plain water. The dashed line is from a control group that was not made sick after drinking salty water. This group preferred plain water, but still drank about 60% as much salty water as plain water. As we can see, all experimental groups drank less than this even the pigeons that got sick 9 or 12 hours after drinking salty water drank less. In other words, conditioning was effective with a very long ISI interval. This long delay learning is found very often in taste aversion learning. After looking at all these experiments, we are finally ready to draw some conclusions. As anticipated, we can make sense of the data by looking at animals as naive detectives. By this, I mean that we can think that animals are constantly trying to figure out what is going to happen. In doing so, they are mostly trying to learn about things they care about, like the availability of food or the presence of predators. I say that they are naive because they don't know what we as experimenters are up to. But this does not mean that they do not have any idea of how the world works. In fact, they often bring to any given experiment some innate knowledge of how things work in nature. This will become more clear in future lessons. For now, let's try to interpret what we have seen in this lesson from the naive detective point of view. For example, when a CS is not new, the animal already has some ideas about it. If we play a sound and there is no meaningful consequence, the detective learns that the sound is not very important. If this changes later, the detective has to change its beliefs and so it will take longer to learn compared to a detective for which the sound is new. We can make the same reasoning with a US that is familiar versus a US that is new. If the US is familiar, the detective knows, so to speak, that it can happen without it being announced by the sound. So if the sound now begins to predict the US, the detective has to revise its belief that the US has no relationship to the sound. And the effect is, again, that the detective will learn more slowly. ISI effects can also be explained similarly. Let's start with the eye blink. We saw that here the effective ISI is fairly short, between a quarter of a second and a few seconds. This makes sense if we think about what is the natural function of the eye blink, that is to protect the eye. In nature, the most obvious case when a sound predicts a threat to the eye is the case of a buzzing insect. You hear a buzz, and then a short time after, a fly hits your eye. It makes sense to learn only about short time intervals, because when you hear the buzzing, the flying is very close to you, and the impact is imminent. It would not make sense for the detective to learn to blink to sounds that happened a half hour ago, because these sounds would have no relationship with the threat of a flying insect. In the case of taste aversion learning, on the other hand, it makes sense to learn about long intervals, because poisons and toxins can take anywhere from minutes to many hours to make you sick. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions of lessons that continue to explore the theme of animals as naive or not so naive detectives. 
happy learning to everyone.